Uh, Sermon on the Mount Morality versus Muhammad's Morality. So we're going to talk about Akbar. Okay. So Akbar is uh, Arabic for greater or larger. Okay. So we're going to we're going to think about this in terms of Muslim terms. Who has the Akbar or the greatest um, morality? Is it Jesus or is it the teachings of Islam? Um, Jesus' moral teachings according to the Sermon on the Mount is what we're going to be looking over today. And then, of course, uh, Muhammad's moral teachings according to himself and to the Quran. <clears throat> so today we're going to compare the statements made by Jesus. Are the moral statements of Jesus Akbar to the moral teachings of Muhammad in the Quran? Clearly, you guys are going to see, and this is why people are asking the questions, like, are you serious? Yeah, we are uh, kind of serious. It seems pretty apparent to most normal people, but a lot of Muslims haven't necessarily thought about this, and I want them to be able to really think about it and determine whether or not they can actually defend the morality of their religion, uh, especially in light of Akbar or greater moral teachings, right? So if the teachings of Jesus, if the teachings of the Bible are actually superior to the teachings of Islam, then it would only make sense that someone leave Islam and embrace the greater moral teachings, all right? So a lot of Muslims, when we start talking about the Bible, they like to say, oh, it's man-made or it's been corrupted and things like that. So I'm just going to ask this little rhetorical question here. Isn't it sad that the man-made book of the Bible or the corrupted book of the Bible is still morally superior to the teachings of Islam? I want you guys to really think about that, all right? So we're going to kind of jump right into the Sermon on the Mount. We've got a lot of stuff to cover today. So let's just jump right into the Beatitudes. So one day he saw the crowds gathering. Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Jesus said, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those who, whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in that same way. All right. So we're going to focus in from the Beatitudes on this persecution aspect, right? So Muhammad, according to the Islamic narrative, was allegedly, allegedly persecuted, but he responded to that persecution by starting a religion that is full of violent persecution as doctrine. He carried out horrendous actions against all kinds of people who opposed him violently, even beheading uh, nearly a thousand Jewish people. And uh, as you can tell by the history of Islam, they violently subjugated, persecuted, and killed anyone who opposed their ideology. Um, and so we can read the Unsheathed Sword by Ibn Taymiyyah. And uh, all we have to do is go to the introduction, the contents, to see how they manage, quote unquote, persecution. I want us to think about, is Muhammad the persecuted? Or is he commanding those who follow him to be the persecutors? Pretty, pretty clear that he commands them to be the persecutors. Right, so this is what it says. The first issue, whoever insults the prophet is to be killed, whether they are a Muslim or a disbeliever. The second issue, killing is prescribed on him, right, the one who insults 
the prophet, and it is not permissible to imprison or show favor upon him or to ransom him. The third issue, any Muslim or non-issue who insults the prophet is not to be given repentance. He is to be killed and repentance is not to be sought for him. Again, persecuted or doing the persecution. When Before we, you go on yeah, there, go I'm just gonna I'm just gonna you know, play the Muslim here and say you're taking the table of content <laughs> it's out of context. <laughs> well, if you actually go and read what the table of contents is saying, you will see further and further proof and examples of the persecution. Um, so I recommend any Muslim who does have that uh, fun objection to actually buy that book. Uh, you can even download the PDF online for free, and you can actually read what it's saying and and all that. So fact check us, fact check every, everything I say. I don't want you to be making, um, you know, religious decisions based on one person's word for it. I want you to actually go on and do the research yourself as well. All right, so Reliance of the Traveler, the most read um, fic manual, right? So the Sharia manual, according to um, Islam, has a lot to say about this persecution stuff. So the Muslims have a consensus that whoever insults Allah or insults his messenger or rejects anything that was revealed by Allah, by the way, that includes the Injil and the Torah, which over 15 times in the Quran explicitly says uh, the Quran came to confirm what was between the hands of the Christians and the Jews at the time, thus indicating that the Biblical scriptures are perfectly preserved according to the Quranic lens, but that's neither here nor there. So anyone who rejects anything revealed by Allah or kills a prophet, then such a person is a disbeliever, even if they affirm every revelation of Allah. Whoever insults the messenger or attributes a defect to him, whether Muslim or disbeliever, then they are to be killed and repentance is not sought. And whoever mentions something which conflicts with what Allah has mentioned, they are to be killed, right? So we're seeing all kinds of persecution happening here. Uh, Malik said, whoever insults him, right, uh, Muhammad, is to be killed and repentance is not to be sought from. Al-Qasim says, whoever insults him or attributes a defect to him is to be killed like the heretic. And some of the Malikis mentioned that whoever designates designated upon the prophet anything from the dislike matters, then they are to be killed and their repentance is not sought. Okay, so here are a bunch of reasons why someone should be killed when it comes to insulting Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. So if a man uh, was heard mentioning a, a, an attribute of the prophet when a man with an ugly face and beard walked past them. So he said, do you desire to know the prophet's attribute? It is the same as this man who walked past. That person should be killed. If they say, hey, look, our prophet looked like this ugly person or this attribute of this ugly person, that person should just for merely mentioning something that might be dis disliked should be killed. A man who said, the prophet was black should be killed. Okay, think about the racist connotations that come along with that. And from them, a man to whom it was said, know by the right of the messenger of Allah. So he said, Allah did such a thing to him, he should be killed. And from them, that a tax collector said, pay and complain to the prophet. If you complain, if you complain about paying your taxes, you should be killed. This is according to the Reliance of the Traveler, the Fiqh Manual. Okay, so the Quran prescribes violence against all unbelievers, regardless of their actions. Allah tells his followers to violently persecute people for merely having different ideologies and expressing those differences in ideology. So we're going to look into these violent prescriptions, right? Not bless those who are persecuted. No, no, no. Be the persecutor, which apparently is causing blessing to those you're persecuting. So let's read through the Quran. Quran 3, 151. We shall cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Quran 2, 191. And kill them, non-Muslims, wherever you find them. Kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. 
Surah 9, 5, then kill the disbelievers wherever you find them, capture them, besiege them, and lie in wait for each of them in every ambush. <clears throat> Fight against Christians and Jews until they pay the tribute, readily being brought low. Christians and Jews must believe what Allah has revealed to Muhammad or Allah will disfigure their faces and turn them into apes as he did the Sabbath breakers. Now, I want to pause here at the Sabbath breaker thing, because I think when you had Mary on um, the other day, uh, she was talking about the days of the week, right? And, and uh, maybe you remember this, Thaddeus. What was she saying about the Sabbath day? This seems like the Sabbath was supposed to be Friday, according to Islam. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, apparently, it was originally Friday. And mm-hmm. then the Jews and Christians both got mad at each other, so they both changed their day. Mm. Uh, the Jews cho- chose to change it to Saturday and the Christians to Sunday. I guess they're like, we can't get along here. We can't have the same day. And then they both just simultaneously <laughs> picked a new day. All right. Makes sense if you don't think about it. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, this is, again, violently persecuting uh, the Jews, the Christians, any non-believer. Quran 930, and the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah, which no Jew in the history of the world has ever said that. And the Christians say the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the sayings of those who disbelieved before. May Allah destroy them. How they are turned away. Okay, so let's take a break here and reflect back on what we had read through with the Beatitudes and then what we read through with some of the Islamic sources. Okay, so Jesus promises those who are humble that they will inherit the earth. Allah has 99 names, none of which are resembling humility. So if we think about this, according to the To Jesus' own standards, Allah, because of his lack of humility, will not inherit the earth, which I kind of agree with. Muslims at the same time are told that they are superior to all those who are not Muslims and that they should humiliate and humble all those who are not Muslims, as you can read about in Surah 9, 29. Um... Jesus says that if the followers of him are persecuted, that is because they are blessed. He promises them that if they truly follow him, that they will endure persecution. Okay, I want to really focus on the, if you want to reach paradise, you must follow Jesus. You must follow him, right? No prophet prior to Jesus ever demanded that the people follow them personally. Okay, if a prophet comes along and says, follow me, as opposed to saying, follow God, that prophet is not really a true prophet. They're speaking blasphemously, right? So unless Muslims and Christians or whoever are willing to say that Jesus is not a true prophet and was pronouncing blasphemy, right, which they won't say, then the only conclusion that one can come to is that Jesus in this particular passage is actually claiming divinity because he's saying follow me if you want to get to heaven um now the other thing that i wanted to take a look at is muhammad explicitly says over and over again that he is not god but throughout the islamic scriptures we see over and over again him commanding people to follow him follow me muhammad says follow me follow me follow me now since Muhammad is not divine, is not God. What Muhammad is saying, right, as no other non-divine prophet ever said, no other prophet said, follow me. They all said, follow God. But Muhammad here is actually being blasphemous by saying, no, you should follow me. Moving back into the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to talk about the salt of the earth. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Okay, so Jesus here is asking people and telling people to do good works, um, that they are the light of the world. And in no way, shape, or form is he telling them to violently persecute and bring darkness onto people who don't believe in them. And it's, in fact, the opposite thing of which Jesus is telling them to do. He's saying to be good so that people will be drawn to the light, not blot them out by the sword. Now, fulfilling the law, we're going to get into this a little bit because this is a pretty common Muslim objection, right? But let's go ahead and read what Jesus says. He says, do not misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will dis disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone um, who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That is, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here, buddy. Are you ready? Sure thing. Sure thing. Okay. So a couple of, uh, first I want us to define a word. So Jesus said that he did not come to abolish the law of Moses, right? Now, Muslims oftentimes misunderstand what this word abolish means. Can you define to us what you think the word abolish means? Uh, get rid of. It, at least that's what the Muslim's going to tell you. Mm -hmm. But what would what's the actual definition of of abolish? Right to rip it up, to tear it up, to throw it away, right? Uh, to to make it no longer apply. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So he says, "No, I came to accomplish, or in other translations, fulfill their purpose." So let's talk about the word "fulfill." Is abolish the same? Is that synonymous with fulfill? They're, they're, they're close, mm -hmm. but no. Right. No, exactly. Right. So if let's say that you and I have a contract, uh, let's say I'm a contractor. I've come to uh, rework your bathroom, right? We have a contract. You're going to pay me X amount of money and I'm going to fulfill the contract by doing what you asked me to do. Now, if I come in, I take your money and I don't do what you ask me to do, Right? And then I rip up the contract, throw it in your face and say, I'm not doing it. I'm just going to keep the money. Is that fulfilling the contract or is that abolishing the contract? Uh, it's definitely not fulfilling. I, I'm not sure I'd use the word abolish, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's definitely not fulfilling the contract. It's, uh, you know, failing to fulfill the contract. It's failing. Yeah, I probably should use a different analogy here. Let's say that we have a contract and then I decide I'm not going to do the work. That would be abolishing it, right? There you go. There yeah. we go. Yeah. As opposed to it. cheating you mm -hmm. and, and taking the money. Yeah. You yeah. just say, uh, never mind, I'm backing out of that contract. Exactly. Right. So that would be considered abolishing. Let's say doing away with it, throwing it away. But as a contractor, I come in and I fix up your bathroom exactly the way that you wanted it to. You pay me my money. I go on my way. Have I fulfilled my contract? I would say yes. Right. So that's the difference between abolishing and fulfilling. So Jesus isn't saying that I'm he's not going to just do away with the contract. No, no, no. He's coming to fulfill the contract. And like any other contract, any other law, right, any other covenant, it stays in place until it is fulfilled. So Jesus says he came to accomplish its purpose or to fulfill its purpose. Right. Muslims fall into an error here as well at, in the very next sentence. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest detail of God's law will disappear. Most Muslims stop right there. So right here, if they stop there, they would be correct in their interpretation. Right. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest detail of God's law will disappear. So they say, has heaven and earth disappeared? And we say, no. 
They said, well, then the law should be exactly as it was. The Levitical law should be in place until heaven and earth are done away with, right? But they forget to, they, they forget to just simply finish the sentence. The law will not disappear. <laughs> wait, until wait, 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 wait. You can't finish the sentence. That's not how you read a text. <laughs> you, you get to the part that you like, and then you yep. pretend there's nothing else there. That's how you properly interpret the text. Exactly, exactly. You you understand proper hermeneutics. I don't, so I'm going to go with my flawed <laughs> logic and finish the sentence. I do apologize. Right, so um, uh, it will not disappear. It will dis not disappear until its purpose is achieved. Okay, so what is the ultimate fulfillment of that purpose, right? Once that purpose is fulfilled, then, right, the smallest dot detail of the law can be, I wouldn't say done away with, but it's been fulfilled, especially when we're talking to the Mosaic laws and, and the prophets, right? So Jesus claims that he himself came to fulfill that law, and the law will stay in place until Jesus fulfills the law. We're going to get into this. We're going to talk about how Jesus fulfilled the law, right? So I just wanted to, uh, to to point that out. One other thing I want to point out in this passage, by the way, if you can't tell, this is one of my favorite passages to talk about because it's so revealing to the nature of Christ. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, Thaddeus. Are right. you, are you perfect? Are you, is your righteousness better than teachers of law, better than the Pharisees, right? Someone who followed the law as closely as humanly possible. Are you better than them? I'm going to have to say no. Okay. Well, Jesus I thought about says, it, but <laughs> right. it's a no. <laughs> so Jesus says that if you are not better than them, if you're not perfect, which he says later, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect, or you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. He says that later in this, in this sermon. Um, which one of us could ever enter the kingdom of heaven? Anyone? Yeah, and, and no one. No one you know, can. Uh, Muslims will go to this passage. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll read that, you know, the one dot or iota of the law not passing on, and they'll jump to the end and say, you have to be righteous to get into heaven. That's what the text is saying. And it's like, yep. well, sort of. You're half right. <laughs> yep, that is would. what it's saying, but it's not telling you that means you got to earn your salvation. It's mm -hmm. telling you that it's impossible because you can't be perfect. Exactly. And that's the point I'm trying to make here. If, if anybody is honest with themselves and humble enough with themselves, none of us have lived a perfect and sinless life, right? If we did, then we might be able to knock on heaven's door when we died and demand to be let in because of our own righteousness, right? But what Jesus is trying to point out, especially here in uh, Matthew chapter 5, is that none of us are good enough. None of us are good enough, not, e not only in deeds, but also in heart and in intention and what it is that we desire to do because we're guilty not only in our actions, but in our desire to take action, whether or not we actually end up taking that action. So when we're reading through this passage, we should be thinking about how desperate we are, how, how much we need to have the grace of a Savior, the mercy of God in order to make us righteous before God, right? Absolutely. Before you go on real quick mm -hmm. here, uh, Swati's been trying to distract about talking about how many different Qurans there are, whether there's one or 30. I asked him if multiple times, if we show you different Qurans while you leave Islam, he doesn't want to answer that question. So I'm going to say it's time to get back on subject, uh, Swati. And you weren't here at the very start, but I'm going to bring this challenge back up here. This is my challenge to Muslims from LMCI. This is our challenge to you, Swati. Prove you are morally worse than Muhammad. If Muhammad's your guide, then you must be morally <laughs> worse than him, right? Uh, we think that you're better than Muhammad, but if you can prove that you're morally worse than Muhammad, then at least that'll be a start. So forget about your your nonsense about all the different versions of the Quran all act saying the same thing, even though they have mm -hmm. different words with different meanings. Mm -hmm. And get on subject. Tell us how one way that you're morally worse than Muhammad. 
Yeah. And I can almost guarantee you when uh, we talk about the different Qurans, he'll be over here talking about the morality of Jesus. He'll just be, it's just <laughs> always, always never staying on topic. And that's, that, that's the goal. Um, you know, that, that's the goal when they're, when they're unfortunately um, been led astray by false ideologies. Um, they, they tend to have the logic and morality of people who are demonized. And one of the things that demons do is they seek to, to distract, to destroy, and to lie. So uh, hopefully he can recognize that within himself, repent of his ways, and turn to a ideology that focuses on actually being good and actually being moral. Uh, so we talked about fulfilling the law, right? Jesus came to fulfill the law. When did this fulfillment happen? Well, in John 19, 30, let's just read. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, in relation to the fulfillment of the law, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Okay. Now, Jesus also says the night before, right, the Last Supper, he said to them, he says, this is the my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. So Jesus is saying his blood is of the new covenant, indicating that there was an old covenant, and now that old covenant will be fulfilled, it will be finished, and that he is now entering into the new era of the new covenant. Okay. Now, Jesus isn't just saying this in a vacuum. There are a couple other ones in this, but I didn't want to get too long winded here. Right. So when we read Jeremiah 31, 31, we can see that God is promising a new covenant. This is what it says. The day is coming, says the Lord, or when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the ones I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them. As a husband, which we're going to talk about this, husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. It sounds like a Holy Spirit thing, doesn't it? I will be their God and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness. And I will never again remember their sins. Now, according to Christianity, who forgives the wickedness of men? Jesus. Who forgives the sins? Jesus. But we read here, Lord in all capitals, L-O-R-D. This is talking about Yahweh. This is another claim for Christ's divinity. Right. So moving on back to the Sermon on the Mount. Hopefully that point was made clear to everyone. Jesus says, you have heard that our ancestors were told you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment, right? But I say, who? I, I, who's making these proclamations of a new law? Jesus, but who can make a new law? Only God. But I, Jesus says, say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Um, Thaddeus, remember that one time? Remember that one time a poor little orphan girl got cursed by Muhammad? <laughs> <laughs> you know that story? Uh, I, not um, vaguely familiar, but maybe you can yeah. recall um, my memory. I, I should have brought it up here. But anyway... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Muhammad, uh, this, this poor little or orphan girl, um, runs to, uh, some lady tells them, Oh, the prophet cursed me and, uh, basically said, I, I hope you don't live a long life. I hope you die soon. And so the lady's like, Muhammad, what is wrong with you, dude? And he's like, Oh, well, uh, me and Allah have a deal that, uh, if I curse someone, uh, by making a mistake and cursing them, that actually that curse will turn into a blessing. 
Right? <laughs> so uh, look this up, Muslims. It's, I'm not making it up. Um, so anyway, and if you curse someone, you're in dangers of the fires of hell, like Muhammad. So if you are presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice at the altar. Go and be reconciled to that person and then come and give your sacrifice to God. So what he's saying here as well, right? It's more important that we we don't make sacrifices. We and, and Jesus says this over and over again throughout the Gospels. He desires mercy, not sacrifice, right? He desires that we do the right thing and not to have to sacrifice. Jesus said, you shall not murder. So when you are on the way to court with your adversaries, settle your differences quickly. Otherwise, your accuser may hand you over to the judge who will hand you over to the officer and you'll be thrown into prison. If that happens, you surely won't be free again until you have paid the last penny. This one's going to be fun for the Muslims. Do not commit adultery. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Um, Thaddeus, do you want to add anything to this? I really didn't prepare a lot for it, and I can spout some things off the top of my head. But do you want to add anything about uh, did Muhammad command adultery was okay, or how did this work? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, there's just so many places we could go. I, I, I'm not sure which one would be best, but uh, I'm thinking about when um, his men were, were away from their wives, and, and they're mm -hmm. like, well, you know, what should we do? We don't want to uh, devalue all these uh, women that we've captured as slaves. We want to sell them for their maximum value. And he's mm -hmm. like, hey, don't worry. Uh, rape them all you like because they're not going to get pregnant unless Allah wills it. So you don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> you don't even that have was the to real concern, this. Yep. Yeah, Yeah, they, they were uh, concerned about devaluing the, these valuable uh, mm -hmm. women that they wanted to sell into slavery um, by making them pregnant. And, and Muhammad in his scientific and moral wisdom tells them that that don't worry yeah your your sperm is not going to impregnate them unless that's what Allah wills. <laughs> oh it all makes sense if you don't think about it okay so uh what's the definition of adultery Thaddeus? that would be any sex outside of marriage okay but more specifically so you're talking fornication and adultery right um so adultery is is fornicating having sex with uh, a married person, whether you are married or the other person is married or both, right? One of the two people are married, correct? Yes. So that would be the more technical definition. Yep. So if anyone is married and you go and have sex with them, have you committed adultery? You have according to the Bible. Right. And, and according to just the definition, well, the definition of adultery, <laughs> right? No, for sure. Um, and not only that, right? A adultery happens not only there, according to Jesus, right? Not only in the action, but it was actually what preceded the action, which was the desire to do so. Okay. Even that desire to do so is. So when we read uh, Surah 424, Muhammad starts out by saying all kinds of great things. He says, married women are unlawful for you. Okay. Are, are you cool with that? Good. We can. Yep. We can yep. Do the, don't, don't go on. Just stop right, right there. Right. right. This right. is, this is kind of like reverse her, hermeneutics, <laughs> right? The Muslim's going to stop there. Right. Uh, but however, Allah couldn't keep his mouth shut there. He had to go on and give an exception, except for those whom your right hands possess. Let's think about this for a second. Jesus says, if you even look at a woman and lust after her, you have committed adultery. Is this morally superior to saying you can actually, under certain circumstances, have sex with a married woman as long as she is your captive? Again, you keep asking all these tough questions, but I, I'm going to go with no. I, I don't think that that's morally superior. I don't think so either. Right. So Jesus goes on. If your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, a lot of Muslims and some Christians don't quite understand what this verse is saying. So let me go ahead and break it down for us. 
fairly briefly, okay? Should you pull your eyeball out or cut your own hand off? No. Not literally. <laughs> Not literally. Now, some Christians in the past did take this literally, um, but they believe they were very, they misunderstood this pretty severely. Where does sin begin, Thaddeus? Where does sin begin? Does it begin in your eye? Does your eye have an actual will or a desire? Does your hand have an actual will or desire? No, it does not. Where does the desire come from, according to the Bible? Well, uh, metaphorically, from the heart. From the heart. From right? our the decisions. Desire come from our heart. Now, is there a, is are there verses talking about the circumcision of the heart being born again with a new with a new nature? There sure are. There are, and so that's what this is talking about. It's it's called being having your heart of stone, or what I like to call it, your animal heart, your animalistic desires, which. Islam says, go for it under cer certain circumstances, but you have those animalistic desires removed and you have the desires of God placed into your heart. Okay. So don't cut out your heart either. But what you need to understand is you need to be born again, you need to be born of the spirit so that your heart of stone will be removed and you will be given a heart. You have heard, Jesus says, the law that says a man can divorce his wife by merely giving her a written notice of divorce. But I say again, right? What authority can Jesus say this? I say, he didn't say God says because, well, fun fact of the day, Jesus is God. But I say that a man who divorces his wife, unless she has been unfaithful, causes her to commit adultery. Anyone who marries a divorced woman has also committed adultery adultery right so jesus here is essentially forbidding divorce except for some very specific reasons so why is divorce forbidden because jesus is metaphorically the groom and his church is metaphorically the bride now the nature of god is to be faithful and he keeps all of his promises he is not the best of deceivers by the way like Satan is, like all it is. He is actually faithful to his promises. And when he makes promises, by the way, we're gonna get into this, when when Yahweh makes promises, when God makes promises, he doesn't swear by things lesser than him. Okay, we're gonna get into that. So his promises, and he will not divorce his people unless they become unfaithful. Marriage is therefore a representation of God's marriage, of Jesus' marriage to his wife, to his church. And he will not forsake her. And he will be willing to lay down his life in service of all of those who obey him. Now, let's talk about marriage in Islam. <laughs> So marriage in Islam, it's, it's honestly the, the, the sacredness in Christianity. We just talked about this, right? This is, this is the, the marriage of Jesus to his church, right? This, the, the marriage in Christianity is so much more powerful than what marriage represents in Islam, right? Uh, marriage in Islam is literally as sacred as buying a car, right? I buy a car, right? Okay. Oh, I like this car. Let me buy it. Let me take it for a ride. Right. Once the car has so many miles on it, you see another car that catches your eye. What do you do? You go to the car dealership and you trade it in for a different model. Right. How hard is it to divorce someone in Islam? Well, if you're the female, you got to go through a whole lot of processes. But if you're the man, right, if you're the man, all you have to do is say talak three times in a row. And guess what? Magically, Allah says you are no longer married you can do whatever you want okay it's absolutely preposterous so it represents nothing sacred right it's just marriage in islam is a pragmatic self-serving action it is not self-sacrificial there is no love that is required in islam sacrifice is not required at least from a husband and a woman is merely a tilth for her husband. It literally says this in the Quran. The woman is a tilth for her husband's seed to fertilize her. And you can approach her in any direction, any Kama Sutra position you would like. You go ahead and do that. And if the woman is not in the mood, she's got a bellyache, 
Guess what happens to her, Thaddeus? What do the angels do if she decides to refuse having sex with you that day? Uh, I believe they curse her. Is that correct? They curse her until the morning. Right? Think about this. Think about your poor wife. And imagine that your daughter or your sister, right, is going to be someone else's wife. Right? And let's say she does not want to have sex with her husband on that particular day. And either A, he's going to force himself on her, or B, the angels, right, who are too afraid to be in the presence of an image or a dog, <laughs> will instead come down because they've got all the time in the world on their hands and curse her into the morning. This is dumb. I, I, this is just, this is dumb. I, that's all I can say, right? So I'm, I'm going to talk about how marriage with a Christian man and a woman represents, right? The sanctity of the relationship between Jesus and the church. But then we're also going to compare the sanctity, right? Or the not sanctity between Allah and his slaves, right? Because a man is kind of like a law in the situation and the wife is kind of like the slave of the man. It's not a sacred thing at all, right? So like I said, the Muslim is merely a slave to a law. A person only exists to serve a law. If a law decides to reject and punish them for any reason, he can do that. And this rep is represented in marriage. There is no relationship in Islam for both marriage and the Muslim's relationship to Allah. The best they can do is be a slave to their master. The best we can do is become children of God. There's a huge relationship issue, okay? And I was alluding to Surah 434 here, where a slave can, a slave master can whip his slave whenever he wants to for any particular reason that he wants to. Now, a man has the right to discipline his wife. He can do it in three ways, okay? And it's, and he, the only reason he has to, the le least amount of reason that he would want to discipline his wife is because he fears disobedience. Not because there's proof of disobedience, not because there's some degree of evidence of disobedience. It's merely a paranoid man having fear. He may have went to bed, had a dream. My wife cheated on me, woke up and said, I'm afraid that you will do this. So I will beat you. Okay. Surah 434 says that you must yell at them. You must banish them from your bedroom and then you must strike them. Okay. Now how you strike them, there's a, there's a differences of opinion here, but again, you have to remember this is your wife. This is someone whom in the Christian worldview, you are supposed to be willing to sacrifice yourself for just because Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself for us. Not in Islam. In Islam, Allah can throw away all of his servants. He doesn't care, right? In Islam, a man can throw away all of his four wives. He doesn't care. The only thing that a man wants is a woman to serve him. The only thing that Allah wants is a, not a relationship. He only wants people to serve him. So what is a Christian marriage? Christian marriage versus Islamic marriage. In Christian marriage, the husband is to be like Christ. He must be willing to lay down his life for his wife. Jesus says that he came to serve and to not be served. So that is what the husband should do for his wife. The husband is like, uh, in, in uh, Islam, the husband is like a law to his wife. She's merely a slave, like I've said before. What talking about here is the Christian morals versus the Islamic morals when it comes to marriage, right? So Jesus is faithful. God is faithful. God keeps all of his promises. Whereas a law can just do whatever the heck he wants. He can reject you if he wants to. He can accept you if he wants to. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So a faithful marriage is important in Christianity because it's like Jesus is to the church. When it comes to Islam, it's a slave to master relationship, just like the husband is the slave master essentially to his wife. They can discard him. So Ephesians 
525. This is a beautiful passage. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Right. So we're going to move forward here. Um, we're going to go into making vows. So you have also heard that our ancestors were told you must not break your vows. You must carry out the vows you make to the Lord. But I say, do not make any vows. Do not say by heaven because heaven is God's throne. And do not say by earth because the earth is his footstool. Um, and do not say by Jerusalem for the Jerusalem is the city of the great king. Do not even say by my head, for you can't turn one hair white or black. Just say a simple yes or no. Anything beyond this is from the evil one. Now, we know that Muslims over and over again speak, right? They say the words, they swear by Allah, right? Over and over again, Wahali or something, whatever they say, they swear by Allah over and over and over and over again. So we're going to talk about how Muslims are rejecting the moral teachings of Jesus. And then we're also going to show a little bit of hypocrisy. And I'm going to demonstrate to you that uh, Allah, according to Muhammad, is a pagan. Okay. So I don't know if you guys remember way back in the day, I think it was a, it was a boys to men, I swear by the moon and the stars and this guy, I'm not going to sing. Okay. But Allah swears by all kinds of things. So Jesus says, if you swear at all, whether it be on God, whether it be on your head, whether it be on the throne, whether it be any of those things, if you swear at all, it is from the evil one. Okay. So we were just talking about how Jesus said, that don't swear, just say yes or no. Anything beyond that is from the evil one. Anything beyond that is satanic. According to Jesus' morality on the Sermon on the Mount, Allah swears, and I am shocked at how many things Allah swears by that are beneath him. How can you swear by something that's lesser than you? I don't know, but let's go ahead and look at it. Allah swears by the book. He swears by the glorious Quran. He swears by the wind that scatters far and wide. Allah swears by the mountain. He swears by the star when it goes down. He swears by the falling stars. Allah says, I swear by the falling stars. He swears by the pen and what the angels write. He swears by the moon. He swears by the day of resurrection. Allah swears by the emissary wind sent one after another for men's benefit. Allah swears by the angels who violently pull out the souls of the wicked. He swears by the mansions of the stars. He swears by heaven and the, and the comer by night. He swears by daybreak. He swears by this city. He swears by the city. He swears by the sun and its brilliance. He swears by the night when it draws a veil. He swears by the early hours of the day. And he swears by the fig and olive tree. He swears by the runners breathing pantily. And he swears by time. Allah swears upon every created thing that you can think of. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says, don't swear. Otherwise, you are from the evil one. And yet here we are reading how many times the evil one is swearing. Because, by the way, Allah is Satan. I hate to break it to you. And this is what's hilarious. Muhammad declares Allah as committing shirk. We just read how many different times Allah swears. Let's see what Muhammad has to say about swearing. The prophet said, do not swear by your fathers or by your mothers or by rivals to Allah and swear by Allah only and swear by Allah only when you are speaking the truth. <laughs> Apparently it's okay to lie. So Muhammad says that you should only swear by Allah and yet Allah swears by everyone but himself. Interesting. What else does, and by the way, all these hadith are sahih in case anybody is going to try to object. 
Allah says, He who swears by Amina, which is a word for faithfulness, is not one of our numbers. Interesting. This is my favorite. Muhammad said, I'm um, sorry, wait, hold on, okay. Ibn Umar heard a man swearing. No, I swear by the Kaaba. Ibn Umar said to him, I heard the apostle of Allah say, he who swears by anyone but Allah is a, what's that say down there? What's that say down there? Polytheist. Polytheist? Wait, wait, wait. Wait, 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 wait. Allah swears by runners, that's not him. Allah swears by time, that's not him. By the sun, by the hours, by the fig and olive tree. Muhammad, Allah swears by all kinds of things, but Muhammad said, he who swears by anyone but Allah is a polytheist. I'm not good at logic, but I'm pretty sure that if you swear by anything besides Allah, according to Muhammad, is the best example for mankind, you are a polytheist. Do the math for me here, Thaddeus. I'm having a tough time. Yeah, you know, when I, I saw the, the, the preview for your, your uh, what you're going to talk about, and I saw this line, I was like, oh, that is gold. That is gold. I'm going to make a video about that. It's ridiculous, right? So, <laughs> so not only it has, according to Jesus' moral teachings, not only has Allah proven to be Satan, he is also, according to Muhammad, his own prophet, he has also proven to be a polytheist. How can you possibly follow a polytheist God who claims to be monotheist, who is the Satan, according to his prophet Jesus, who is a m much greater moral teacher than anyone else? I think it's actually coming together here, though, because uh, Muhammad declares Allah a polytheist, and as we know, Allah prays for Muhammad. Mm -hmm. We don't know who he's praying to, but apparently one of the other gods, because he's a polytheist. He believes in many gods. He could be. And and if and if he wanted to have a child, he could have had it from someone among us, right? So the, the, it, clearly this is from a polytheistic background, right? Clearly uh, the the Quran and Islam is is pagans best attempt to become monotheists and yet here we are looking at it going huh it makes sense that they're trying to get away from polytheism but they're still because they're so familiar with it they they didn't quite they didn't they didn't spell check they did not do grammar check their editor missed a bit of nonsense in there and uh, <laughs> luckily lucky for us huh, here we are the christians get to come along and show you how much of a polytheist and how much Satan Allah is. Pretty cool, right? Yep. And, um, and as we know, the the Quran is not at all corrupted. It's perfectly clear. So when the, when the clear Quran as mud. says that Allah swears by the cities, for example, which is very interesting <laughs> because those are man-made. He's, he, he's swearing by man-made things, mm -hmm. not just creation. That, uh, you know, that's what it actually means. That's what Allah actually wrote down in his, in his eternal word that has that he made before he even created the earth. So, I mean, I, I don't know how to what to say other than Allah is confirming what we already knew. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's clear as mud. Like I said, it's about as clear as the mud that the sun sets into. So, um, pretty 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 easy to understand. Um, turn the other cheek. Back to the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard the law that says the punishment must match the injury. Right, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which is the only verse, by the way, that the Quran actually quotes of the Bible. <laughs> but I say, do not resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, offer the other cheek also. If you are sued in court and your shirt is taken from you, give your coat too. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. Give to those who ask and don't turn away from those who want to borrow. Um, Muslims tend to hate this passage, don't they? Yeah. Um, I'm going they, the wrong they, they're like, why would I want to follow Christianity? That just makes you into a weakling. A weakling, right? So Muslims do think this is weak, and that's because they merely think like humans, and they don't have the thoughts of God in mind. 
One of my favorite passages to go to, speaking of the thoughts of God and speaking of the thoughts of humans, is to point out once again that Islam is satanic according to Jesus. So if you may recall, Peter said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Right, And then Jesus goes on to explain how he must suffer many things by the chiefs, the elders, and the, uh, and the priests, and be killed, and on the third day raised again. Right, So Jesus here is saying that uh, Surah 4, 157, in the Quran, which says he wasn't killed nor crucified, he is saying, no, I will be killed and crucified. So as a prophet, as a prophet of Allah, the Muslims should believe him. Jesus prophesied that he was going to be killed and on the third day resurrected. But they don't believe him, because why? They have no consistent logical argument for anything, so they just say whatever they want and however they feel. Okay? So Jesus, uh, so Peter says, Far be it from you, Lord. This will not happen to you. I will not allow this to happen to you. And anyone who says this, by the way, this applies to anyone who says that Jesus will not be killed nor crucified. Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the thoughts of God in mind, but only the thoughts of men. So Allah does not have the thoughts of God in mind. He only has the thoughts of men in mind. Muslims do not have the thoughts of God in mind. They only have the thoughts of men in mind. That's probably why they think that heaven is just going to be one gigantic orgy with a flowing stream of wine. That's probably why, because they think that's the greatest thing that could ever happen to us. They discount the fact that just being in the mere presence of God fulfills every desire that we could ever possibly have. They don't think Allah can actually fulfill their desires. They think he has to fulfill their desires through giving them hedonistic pleasures, as opposed to just being in his presence. Right. So philosophically, we do believe in heaven and hell. So having the thoughts of God in mind... Should we forsake our eternal salvation for temporal comforts in this life? No. What sins are permissible for temporal comforts if they condemn our souls to eternal hellfire? Truly, who is stronger and who is weaker? Right? This is why they think we're weak. Who is stronger, who is weaker? Someone who restrains their animalistic urges and practices righteousness, like the Christians are supposed to do. Or a person who yields to their animalistic nature and thereby practices unrighteousness? Just a question for you guys to think about. Love your enemies. You have heard the law says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, again, I say because Jesus is God, love your enemies. What? Pray for those who persecute you. What? In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends his rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you only love those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I did a word search in the Quran on Quranics.com for the word love in the Quran. The word love is in there 100 times. Guess how many times it says Allah loves someone before they loved him, Thaddeus. Well, that one's going to be easy. That one's going to be zero. Not a single time does Allah say that he loves anyone before they love him. Now, let me reread this again. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even the pagans do that. So if Allah refuses to love the unbelievers, how is he different than a pagan? 
Is he? No. No. No, no difference. All right. So here we see Allah is a pagan, according to the, the first chapter on the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Allah swears like a pagan. He swears like someone inspired by Satan or perhaps someone who is actually Satan. And Allah gives love only to those who love him, making him no better than pagans and tax collectors. So let's review a little bit here. Muhammad's failed moral teachings. They teach that pride is a virtue in Islam. They teach that violent aggression is a virtue in Islam, but it's not. None of those things are virtuous. Those are sinful. Muhammad says to follow him. The Quran says to follow Muhammad. All the other prophets say to follow God. Which one of these is different than the others? So Muhammad and the Quran saying to follow a mere man is committing blasphemy. Muhammad made halal all kinds of adultery. Muhammad desanctified marriage. And Jesus says that sin is of the heart, not just in action. Pretty simply, in conclusion, the teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, and we've only gone through one chapter, are vastly superior to the teachings of Islam. And like I said at the beginning, we can grant that perhaps the Bible is man-made. That makes it worse for you Muslims because you would have to admit that a man-made book is greater than the Allah-revealed scripture when it comes to moral teachings. So I implore you, Muslims, to please, please think about everything that we've said today. Think about everything we've covered. Try to come up with arguments against it. And I assure you that when you do that, you will find the truth and the truth will set you free. Anything you'd like to add, Mr. Thaddeus? Oh, well, uh, Safras just came in. He's been on my channel a couple of times. Sassafras? <laughs> He's unaware of the topic because he comes in and says, Allah is the most merciful. Allah will forgive all sins, which is not correct. Okay, cool. Then I'll just <laughs> sin and not have to worry about it. Sweet deal. Absolutely.